Okay, cool. We're talking about the uh, press room. Obviously, one of the biggest larger than life characters of recent times. John McCrick's no longer with us. Do you have any uh, any stories about John you can share with us? Yes, I. Um, Nick Lucker uh, interviewed me on his program after John sadly passed away, and he said at the end of it, he said, "I think it's the the best sort of." Um, review of his life that um, I've heard I, I was actually he rang me two weeks ago here in deepest Kent and um, out of the blue and, um, and and I said how are you and he said oh no no he said I'm, I'm finished so I won't see Christmas I said oh come on and I tried to I said come on come on you've got a new start of the football season and Newcastle United which I used to try and cheer him up about and then he'd go uh, and he said uh, no CD he said I'm eating to live well, I don't want to live I said that's that's terrible you know after all you've done and been through and you know he would tell me in, in articles that he he failed at everything he came away from Harrow he failed as a bookmaker he was on the Downs at Epsom, and they had to do a runner almost because the, <laughs> there wasn't enough money in the bag. And then he worked at the Dorchester, and then he worked as a waiter, and he spilled a whole bowl of soup over some lord and other. And so he got the sack there. He failed at everything, but he then created that one unique role in in the British uh, well television landscape, not just racing, but television. And I used to go to posh dinner parties and people who didn't know me, they said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a horse racing correspondent. And they, I count to 10 because I knew in that time they would say, oh, do you know that awful man who waves his arms on television? And I said, yeah, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, but he created the wrong impression. Uh, he was an actor. I always used to think he was half Burl Ives, half Henry VIII, half Robert Morley, the English gentleman. Um, but it was all an act. And with the booby, I mean, he used to say things to her on air and all this. It was a complete act. He absolutely worshipped her, and he would have been lost without her. I had, um, he was like me in my youth, not so much now. He was a great Surrey County Cricket Club fan. He used to go to the Oval in the early 50s, 60s, in his shorts, can you imagine? Under the gasometer watching the great Surrey side, and uh, Tony Locke was his hero, Lockie as he called him. And then I was invited many years later to a test match in, in the pavilion at to the Oval in the committee room. And I said to this friend of mine, who was cricket chairman, can I bring a friend? And he said, of course you can, CD. I said, well, it's John McCrick. Will that cause any problems? No, of course not. Why should it? So I rang John. Oh, are you serious? I said, yes. I said, be outside the Hobbs gates. 10.30 next Thursday, first day of the test match. And we went in up into the committee room. John Major was president of Surrey that year and he was in there. And I did say to John, now the cameras aren't going to be rolling. This is a private function. I've been invited. Please don't embarrass me. All I want you to do is just enjoy the day, take in the atmosphere and you'll sit in the best seat in the house. When we sat down and the game started, we only bowled about three overs and the steward tapped me on the shoulder from behind and he said, Mr. Duval, um, Alec Bedser, I said, oh yes, uh, do you mind if you swap seats with him? And I thought, you know, I said, yes, of course I will. He said, Alec Bedser is so keen to meet John McCrick. So I said, right, so we swapped and I sort of half knew Alec and we nodded. And we sat down. The next thing I looked across, and there's Bedser describing how he's bowling his in floaters and out swingers and done this and that. But even more surprisingly, there was McCrick with his old Horobian blazer on, and he's describing to Bedser how he used to bowl in school matches at uh, Harrow. You know, uh, I just couldn't believe it. But no, I loved him. I used to go to the Breeders' Cup every year. He loved Florida, Miami. We stay in the same hotel. And he'd go down by the pool with the full Newcastle United gear on. Can you imagine? The biggest shorts you've ever seen in your life. And we'd sit by the pool and people would come along and say, hello, Mr. McCrone, no, no, no. And 
he didn't really want to get involved with people. But he, he was a strange man because I've said since he died, if he walked into a restaurant and nobody recognised him, he'd be absolutely crestfallen. He yearned, he yearned uh, people being re recognising him and all the rest of it. But I mean, I stayed with him for um, a couple of test matches uh, in, uh, in in Primrose Hill, and he said to me once, "Ah, Juval, you know the last person to sleep in that bed?" And I said, "No, I've got no idea." And he said, "Edwina Curry." I said, "Oh, thank you very much. That's interesting." And of course, they did that wife swap program. And everybody thought it was a big act between him and Edwin and Curry not getting on. I can assure you it was not an act. They absolutely loathed each other. Uh, the, the booby, however, got on quite well with Mr. Curry. They, they, they were playing. But no, I, I, I like John. He was, he was good to me a couple of times. Um, uh, he, he was the star of that uh, Channel 4 show and Morning Line, wasn't he? And you would never, you would never ever know how much preparation he put into those programmes. He used to send the booby down to King's Cross on a Friday night to buy all the first edition of the papers, every paper. Back they'd come, he'd go through it all, cut it out, and then when the morning line started the next morning, he would quote articles from all the papers because he'd done his homework. And I mean, Alistair Down, who I'm a great admirer of, and John Frankham, who's been a great friend, they would walk in with about five minutes to the cameras rolling, and there would be McCruick still looking through all the papers, but they were such natural personalities. John couldn't do that. He couldn't do after-dinner speaking. He couldn't stand up and tell you a joke, save his life, but he could do the preparation, and he, 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 he was... Well, he was a giant in my eyes, in, in more ways than one. I, I loved him, and um, I'm glad that we now here we can look back and know that his ashes have been scattered at the one furlong pole at Ali Pali by the booby, which was his... He hated religion. We used to have bitter arguments. You know, uh, I live in a house where John Wesley preached, and I have a religious sort of background, would you believe? But we, we had endless arguments, and he was so anti-religion. He said religion has, has caused more wars and more deaths than anything else. And he said, there's no heaven, there's no hell, don't fall for all that. And he said, when I go, I just want to be burnt and the ashes scattered at Ali Pali, where he used to go as a young man. He, uh, he told me one story about how he turned up at Ali Pali one day, and this big Rolls Royce turned up in front of him chauffeur driven and in the back and he could barely see this little figure sitting in the back on his own in the middle of these huge great seats was the one and only Scobie Breezley. He never forgot that. No, I love, I love John and uh, I would defend him uh, to the bitter end. Now there's another character, a big character on the race course, a religious background, um, very famous clip with him and John, Barney Curley. Have you got any Barney stories you can share with well, us? Well Barney, I was... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I was at Folkestone, which has now been closed seven years, can you imagine, this autumn, which I think is a complete and utter tragedy. We lost Y shortly after I joined the Sun. Now we've lost Folkestone. That, but that's the point. It was at Folkestone with the famous live interview with B.J. Curley, and when he came storming out of the steward's room and attacked Luke Harvey, you know, you're an underachiever. Matt Chapman, you owe everybody. And McCrick, I helped you out once. Don't you forget it. And it, it was, it was. And then when he finished, they couldn't get the three of them. They couldn't get a word in. And he said, "That's it. End of show." And uh, no, I loved him. I met him first time in the early seventies at Leopardstown, where he walked around. He didn't have the old fedora in those days. You could see him coming a mile away. The, the domed head the old ex-Jesuit priest, and he always had a black, sorry, a leather doctor's bag at the end of his hand, where he had all the readies to doing all his punting. And I said to somebody one day, I just noticed something about that fellow. And there was a chain on his hand at the bottom. So if any rogue in Dublin, and they, he'd, have, he'd have had punts galore on him, you know, literally, wanted to steal any money. They had to get the bag. 
but to get the bag they had to have the whole BJ Curley. He was a journalist dream to me as the punter's power because he was always attacking the bookmakers. Sometime I wondered whether that Jesuit halo slipped a bit and I thought well is he a saint or is he a sinner? But what he's done in his life is devote so much money and attention to raising money for unfortunate children in Africa. Um, he loves children. The tragedy with him when I really got to know him was that his son Chuck was killed in a car crash when the boy was in his teens I think. Uh, and I don't think to this day he's ever got over that. A man deeply religious um, he had this son who he worshipped and adored, um, uh, who was killed in that way on some ice between their home in Stetchford and going to the stables in Exting, as it were. Um, he knew that I was about to become a proud father for the first time in my forties, uh, and at York. I walked onto the course the first day and he was sitting there in his usual place by the weighing room and he said has there been a has there been a population in explosion in Rolvenden yet and I said there has been Barney hallelujah he said follow me and we walked there around the corner and York my favorite race course I have to say this they've always had a champagne of the day which half the price of uh, uh, champagne at Royal Ascot and we walked in and he walked up to the bar and I'd never seen him in a bar in a race course in my life. And I'd known him for 35, 40 years at that stage and he said um, a bottle of, bottle of Bollinger and a Diet Coke and I looked at him and I thought, and he produced this great wad of reddish in his back pocket. It almost made me cry. And he's throwing these, throwing these 20s across the bar. And uh, I had a glass of champagne and then, and I said, Barney, what's all this about? He said, you celebrate the birth of that boy of yours and I'll have the Diet Coke. So I stood there and drank the champagne and... Um, and he had the Diet Coke and he used to ring me in this very room, hasn't done recently but a few years ago every Christmas Eve the phone would ring and my wife would say who on earth would be ringing us at this time of night and I'd pick up the phone and he'd say Claude it's your old friend Barney just have a happy Christmas <laughs> I used to say bless you and that was it you know I loved him I still love him um, he's uh, that old halo to me has never slipped far. He, he's Saint Barney as far as I'm concerned.